Good morning. It's Pastor David here. We're opening up our phone, which is low because I didn't charge it last night. Well, I charged it, then I left it out. It, it was a busy night. I woke up at like 1.30 and my wife was up cleaning things. And I'm like, you know what? She's not normally up cleaning things at 1.30. What's going on, honey? And uh, she was just in a place. And so we just talked for a while and uh, there we are, going live, getting the Facebook up. That way, if you guys ask questions, I can respond to them here on the broadcast, podcast, whatever you want to call it. I will say there is a beautiful painting behind me done by one amazing Elaine Makuha, who um, does a lot of our artwork around the church. She is. A, I'm going to call her our resident artist and songbird because she's around here singing and she's around here painting and just making this place more beautiful. Good morning, Debbie. Good to see you this morning. Um, <clears throat> we are in Isaiah chapter 40. Now, this is part two of this because when we did part one, and this microphone stand is just a little tall. Uh, when we did part one, <clears throat> I focused mainly on the two-person authorship of Isaiah controversy that has kind of come up in modern times. It's more of a modern invention that people have said, good morning, Carolyn, it's good to see you, that Isaiah was written by two people um, <clears throat> because a lot of the language in chapters 40 to the end uh, carries with it post-exilic meaning, meaning after the exile to Babylon as they're coming back. Um, but what I tried to show is that there's a lot of evidence, too, though, that this was actually not just to exiles coming back, but that Isaiah would have been preaching in his own time to the people that had survived the Assyrian invasion because the Assyrians carried off people. The Assyrians did a lot of damage. And, and a lot of times when you read the Bible story about um, Hezekiah being delivered, you know, because God strikes the Assyrians and the Assyrian army leaves and, and we can show archaeologically that there's evidence for this, um, just in Herodotus and other in other um, writings of the time, stories passed down. Um, yeah, I know my phone is gonna. Yeah, I'm, I might not be able to see you guys today because my phone battery is out. Um, so I will just say hi to you guys when I see you in the comments a little later on. But anyway, <clears throat> even though the Assyrian army is struck, and we see that dramatic deliverance of Jerusalem, understand that all the people in the land around Jerusalem, pretty much the rest of the country, Lachish and all the other cities had been devastated, destroyed. Not only were the cities destroyed, but all the crops would have been eaten by the invading army. They would have taken what they needed to supply their own needs. So <clears throat> even after the victory, even after the people are leaving the city of Jerusalem and leaving the walls of Jerusalem, they're coming back to a land that has been devastated. You know what I can do, actually? I'm going to see if this works. I'm going to try and bring up on a separate stream here the Facebook page and see if I can still watch you guys for comments. Because when you say things, I do want to respond back and say, hey, what's up? Good morning, Nicole and Abby. Good morning, and Michael Anderson. By the way, one of the reasons why we moved our time um, to 7 o'clock versus 6.30 is because I looked and saw that time-wise, most of the people that watch our YouTube live streams, they peak out around 8 o'clock. Um, so this hopefully will give some people who wouldn't normally be able to see a chance to join in with us. Good morning, Terry Riley and Rachel Osborne, who's gone through some great life changes here lately. Good times there, obviously. Um, so it had been kind of on my mind to move this down to, to 7 o'clock. Not all of you are, you know, crack of dawn people like myself. Um, although this morning I did sleep in till 5, you know. Um, Anyway, back to the text. Isaiah chapter 40 starts with, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of forced labor is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So in reference to who Isaiah is prophesying to at his time, he uses the words, Comfort, comfort my people. And he can be referring, because again, I believe prophetic word tends to reverberate. It tends to echo. It tends to be true, not only in its own time, but for every time to come, right? I believe that when you look at even in books like Revelation, where they're, they're strictly prophetic books, 
that what happens in Revelation happens again and again through time. Now, there's one ultimate, ultimate culmination of Revelation coming, but we've seen ripples of Revelation ever since John the Beloved penned it in 90 A.D. Um, in addition, Isaiah is writing here, and, and we know historically Isaiah is going to die in the time of Hezekiah. So um, in the preceding chapters, Hezekiah was sick. Isaiah says God's going to give you 15 more years. In those 15 years, he actually gives birth to one of the worst kings of Israel, Manasseh, who is going to lead them deep into idolatry and deep into bad things. But Isaiah, we know from other records, is going to pass away in the time of Hezekiah. He's never going to see the birth of Manasseh. He's never going to see the birth of the last great king of Israel, Josiah, and he's not going to live to see the exile, and certainly not 70 years after that to the return. We're talking, you know, 110, 120 years between the time of the exile return and the time of Isaiah. So, <coughs> sticking to, to the fact, sticking to the the assertion that this is all written by one author. I'm looking at the book of Isaiah as a person writing prophetically to his own people at his own time about things that they're going through that are also going to have true meanings and prophesying about things that are going to happen in the future that he's speaking of in, um, I think it's 42 and 43. We'll see here just a few chapters. He's going to mention the name Cyrus, and mentioning the name Cyrus is where a lot of scholars struggle with the authorship of Isaiah because Cyrus isn't going to live for another 120 years after Isaiah is born. However, I do not believe that in and of itself is enough to say that it has two authors because you would have to convince me then that Isaiah would not know the name Cyrus or know the word Cyrus or that it was an invention of language that came after the time of Isaiah, that he would have no concept. And even then, I do believe in a supernatural God who could reveal to Isaiah at that time about the coming of Cyrus. When I read chapter 40, one, um, in verse 2 there, when it says her time of forced labor is over, that forced labor is where people begin to draw the exilic comparisons, meaning people coming back from captivity, coming back from exile, coming back from a time of forced labor. That's who's coming back here. But let's start here with this where it says, comfort, comfort my people. I like this because the whole chapter of chapter 40 is a chapter of breathing. It's a chapter about the breath of God. The ruach is the Hebrew word, and it means just when God breathes something. And, and all through here, you're going to see where he's breathing and talking and speaking, and breath is proceeding forth, and the word is proceeding forth. And just th think about this sometimes. What an amazing thing it is that you and I, even, even, if it was, even without the advent of technology, even without the internet here, I can use the breath that comes into my lungs. I can push that breath out through a series of valves inside my trachea, and those valves are going to open and close in a certain way. They're going to vibrate the air. And they're going to vibrate the air in such a way that you have tiny little bones in your ears, and those bones are going to vibrate. And those bones are going to vibrate according to how I vibrated the air, and you're going to pick up those vibrations, and your brain is going to understand the words, and now my soul is communicating to your soul right, in a medium, in a language that we can both understand, and all of these things have to happen in order for that to happen. It's just one of those amazing things about creation. Um, if ever you want to look at things like design, think about the fact that we have a trachea built to vibrate air and bones that are built to receive those vibrations, and somehow, when I have love, joy, peace, when I have, when I have despair, depression, anxiety, when I have all these emotions, complex things, when I feel honor, I feel shame, when I feel any good thing or any bad thing, I can express that to you by breathing out. And somehow you receive that and know what I'm going through. And even more so that God, when he breathes out, that we can receive communication from God. That God is an ever speaking God, speaking to his people. And here coming back from the devastation of the Assyrian army, when the whole land is laid waste, when all the cities have been destroyed, when Jerusalem itself was the only place that was spared, he says, comfort, comfort my people. And that word comfort there means to make them breathe again. Right? The, the root of it is something like, the, like a sigh, like a, right? Comfort my people. Bring them back to life. Raise them up, right? Breathe into them again. And so 
when he's saying this here to comfort, comfort my people, understand that he's giving a command. This is another thing about this particular chapter is that it refers to what is called the counsel of God. And the counsel of God comes up in different places. And I'll point it out in the scripture when we get here. But understand the concept of the counsel of God is something akin to what you read in Genesis chapter 1 and in um, Job chapter 1 and in Isaiah chapter 6 where God is speaking to a heavenly host. He is having a communication. Um, what is it? First Kings 18, um, the story of Micah the prophet. It might, it's either First Kings or Second Kings. I think it's First Kings 18, uh, where Micah the prophet says, you know, the Lord, the Lord asked, who shall I send to, to bring Ahab to his destruction? And, and the, the different angels appear. And then there was the deceiver says, I will go and be a lying spirit. And, of course, we know who that deceiver is, right? Well, in the same way, in, in the book of Job, chapter 1, it says the sons of God went to appear before God, and the accuser comes in with them. We have the person who's the deceiver and the person who's the accuser. And, again, we know who that is. But understand... <coughs> That in the context of this, he's coming into the presence of God to make accusation against the saints or to accuse the saints or to deceive the saints that he's that he's that trying spirit. He is the adversary. He is the enemy of man. Satan is not the enemy of God because God has no rival. God has no equal. There is no one who can lay claim to being God's rival. Satan is our rival. Satan is our problem. He is not a problem for God. If God wanted to be done with Satan, God could just, you know, move his hand and Satan would be gone. But in these different places, God has a counsel. And it's not a counsel of, hey, I need people's advice. It's a counsel of the Lord God asking those around. Of course, my, my own little pet theory, my own little thought inside my head is when we talk about life after resurrection, we talk about the great eternal kingdom. We talk about when the new heaven and the new earth come, when all the old things pass away, when we have been in the presence of God, when we have been in heaven, when we've been walking down the streets of gold and seen the new Jerusalem, and we've seen the glory and the revelation of Jesus Christ, that I don't believe that is the end of our existence. I, you know what I'm saying? I don't believe it. I, 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 and, and when I say I don't believe, okay, and, and this, this is where the Scripture guides me. And there are several places where the Scripture guides, but it doesn't exactly, it doesn't directly spell out. But when you see places here where God is giving commands to people that are in his counsel, that are not people of earth, but he's taking, he's giving counsel to those in the heavenlies, that I always picture us in the resurrection after, after we have been redeemed, being in his counsel over other creations where we are the angels and we are the messengers of God and we are the heralds of his grace and of his mercy. And I, and I just, I always get that picture in my head that, that God has so many more things for us after our time on earth is ended, after we have been through everything and learned what we need to learn here and grown like we need to grow. And then we get into that perfect presence of God and we are transformed that we become heralds of a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. And so you kind of see that here. As we go through chapter 40, and he's talk, he's taking counsel and speaking to people in the heavenlies. He's speaking to cities, and it's all about that breath of God breathing out. So, again, verse 3, a voice, again, breathing out, of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness, make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Now, we know that this is going to be the verse that the New Testament is going to say. This is about John the Baptist. He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He's making straight the path of the Lord. John the Baptist is trailblazing the path for Jesus. He's, he is the precursor. He is the one setting everything up. Jesus is coming, and John is a witness to him, and John even comes to the place where he says, I am must decrease that he might increase and he's that sorry when my phone beeps i i thought it was dead and then it beeps at me um so <clears throat> first he says a voice of one crying out prepare the way of the lord in the wilderness make straight the highway for our god in every desert every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be leveled the uneven ground will become smooth and the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity together will see it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And oh my goodness, when you talk about a messianic prophecy, not just in the messianic prophecy that John the Baptist is going to be the precursor to Christ, but see what it's saying about John the Baptist. That he's, making, he's making hills and mountains level and uneven ground smooth. It's talking about the message is going out. Oh, I, I'm going to divert a little bit here and tell you something neat about John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist, he was called John the Baptizer because he baptized everybody in the Jordan River. The reason why he did that is because of this. In order to go into the temple, past the court of the Gentiles, into the more holy places, you had to go through what was called a mikvah. A mikvah was a ceremonial cleaning. Whenever you read in the Old Testament that they become ceremonially unclean, there were different procedures. They had to become ceremonially clean again, and one of those procedures was a mikvah. The mikvah is the precursor to the, to the Christian baptism. And the mikvah, the rules of the mikvah were just just much like Christian baptism is it you would use living water where you had it if you didn't have living water you would have a pool of water and that pool of water you would dip down in and this is the great part three times so even the Jews knew you would baptize in the mikvah three times right and then you would be clean and then you could enter the temple so um in the early in the early synagogues and things like that they would always have a mikvah built. That's how they could tell where the synagogues were because the synagogues would have a mikvah, which is interesting because churches still have baptismals, that that's still a part of how we know, you know, and, and it's a ceremonial cleaning, right? Christ has already done the work in our heart, but when we go into the baptism, there's a, ceremonially, a ceremonial cleaning that takes place. Well, right here when he's saying, the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity together will see it for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. John the Baptist baptizes in the Jordan River because the Pharisees and Sadducees controlled access to the mikvah at the temple in Jerusalem. So if you wanted to enter the temple in Jerusalem, you had to go through the mikvah, and they controlled access to that. So you would never be clean enough to go into the temple without the permission of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So in a way, they had made themselves gatekeepers into the presence of God. You cannot go into the presence of God and into the temple unless you go through us. And so John said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to the Jordan River. I'm going to invite people to come repent of their sins and be clean and have that same cleansing there in the river, right? Thereby bypassing all the procedures of the Pharisees and Sadducees that had locked people out, right? And that's why the teachers of the law started coming down and looking at John the Baptist like, what is going on here? But his doing this... His doing this has prepared the way for Christ to come and for Christ's message. And this is the thing. It says, the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity together will see it. So again, Christ comes and his, he is the glory of God. Christ is the visible representation of the glory of God. He is the image and likeness of God. He is the imprint of God, right? He is when God leaves a mark. But more than that, he is called the incarnation. And that means that he is the word of God made Flesh. So when John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God, by Him were all things made, and without Him was not anything made that was made. It's saying that Jesus is the very Word of God, and Isaiah is here calling it. He's saying there's going to be a voice calling in the wilderness, and when that voice calls, all humanity is going to see the glory of God, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." God is going to speak Jesus into the world, right? The incarnation, the virgin birth, all of those things, the word of God being made flesh, that Christ walks as God among us, Emmanuel, God with us as the incarnation. Verse 6, <clears throat> oh, yeah, oh gosh, right? Man, I, there's, there's so many other things here. Um, there's a reference here. If you've ever heard the term Shekinah glory, Shekinah glory, Shekinah does not actually occur in the Hebrew in the Bible. Shekinah is actually a word that, it, that it comes in the commentaries by the Jews on the scripture, and it's the word they use for the glory of God. So when they're talking about, like, for instance, the glory of the Lord will appear, they're talking about the Shekinah will descend, the Shekinah will be around us, right? And there's, there's more there than I am even prepared to go into. So let's go to verse 6. A voice was saying, cry out. Another said, what should I cry out? All humanity's grass, its goodness is like the flower of the field. Start there. A voice was saying, and then another voice said. So again, there's a council going on here. There are different voices saying in the council of God. And the council of God is never, you know, God needs advice or God has some lack that he has to make up in a council. It's more the council of the king, meaning God, the master creator of the universe, with the ones to whom he delegates his authority to see his his will done. And he says, what should I cry out? All humanity is grass and all its goodness is like the flower of the field. The grass, grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of God blows on them. When the ruach comes, it, it can destroy or it can give life. It can comfort the people and bring them back or it can wipe the people off the map. It all depends on what the word of God says. Indeed, the people are grass. The grass wizard, grass withers. 
say grass withers five times fast. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. The word of God is inevitable. The word of God is unchangeable. The word of God is forever. The heaven and earth can pass away, but the word of the Lord will never pass away. That's why death couldn't take Jesus, because he was the word of God. He was the spoken word of God. And even hanging on the cross, the words of Jesus, the seven phrases that he says before he gives his life up and goes back to be with the Father and returns again, you cannot destroy the word of God. That if heaven and earth, if this planet exploded, some how this word of God would still exist because it is a word that God has spoken and it is unchangeable, unending, will be with us forever. And now verse nine, this is kind of, this is, there's, gosh, there's so many cool things going on here. Um, okay. Verse nine, <clears throat> we're going to do verse nine through 11 here. And what I want to say is in verse nine through 11, they use as the, um, Gender on the nouns, feminine gendered nouns. Now, um, English is different than other languages in that we can have gender neuter terms like it, they, them, right? That means there's no gender assigned. In Hebrew, um, all words have a gender. Well, not all words, but all nouns have a gender. Uh, verbs have a gender. There's gender assigned to words where we wouldn't see it in our own languages. There are several languages that are like this, but English isn't. And so sometimes understand this. For instance, when he says Zion, herald of good news, He's using the feminine noun for Zion. Now, a couple of things. One, that is exactly what I would expect because whenever God refers, whenever the word refers to things of the earth, um, that the earth is feminine in Scripture. Um, the, the church is feminine, right? The church is the bride of Christ. In relation to God, he is always the masculine and we are always the feminine. God is oh, God is overwhelmingly referred to as masculine in scripture or as having masculine characteristics um, and things like the earth and cities and countries are referred to in the feminine sense and I believe there's meaning in that um, I do not believe that gender is a social construct meaning we don't come up with the rules and say okay guys are always this and girls are always that that there is a part of that there is a beauty to femininity that is built into women that God has created them a specific way as a woman to have gifts and callings and abilities that are different than those who are created as men and giving different callings and abilities now I will also say that no man is hundred percent masculine and no woman is hundred percent feminine and there is a spectrum there um and the gender and sexuality need to be split up there too because and, I, and i'm going to go way out way out into the weeds there the reason i wanted to say all of that and, and we can have that discussion another time is this that they're using the feminine voice when it says zion herald of good news go up on the high mountain jerusalem herald the good news raise your voice loudly raise it do not be afraid say to the cities of judah here is your god in verses 9 through 11 we're going to get what is eventually going to become the root for the word evangelism in the new testament when they talk about the evangelist when they talk about john being an evangelist when they talk about evangelization proclaiming the news being a herald this is the language that begins to form that and what i like is that that language begins in a feminine sense that there are daughters of the message like the old pro the old testament talks about the nabaye the prophetesses right the women who have a message the women who have a voice to speak the word of god um I, oh gosh i could go so many places here um and i'm trying to stay on on track germane to the discussion what i do like here is the first time i ever heard the song go tell it on the mountain uh, I don't know, I was on, I don't know who it was, but man, it was a deep voice, like, go tell it on the, and you always, I always picture that song with a deep masculine voice, but in the book of Isaiah, it would have been a woman's voice who would be going and telling it on the mountain. It would be a feminine voice saying, go tell it on the mountain. Zion, herald of good news, go up on a high mountain. Jerusalem, herald of good news, raise your voice loudly. Raise it and do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Understanding, too, that they're coming out of Jerusalem, back to their farmlands, back to their homes, after the Assyrians have left with 
utter devastation, just burned everything. And he's speaking comfort to these people going back into this land. Listen, here is your God. Verse 10, see the Lord comes with strength and his power establishes his rules. His wages are with him. His reward accompanies him. In Revelation 22, 12, it says the same thing, that the Lord brings his reward with him. Understand that in this world, sometimes it seems like the righteous, pickleball eight, <laughs> that the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. But we know that at the end of all things, God will set all accounts even. He will zero them out. Every man will be judged according to his works, right? According to whether or not he knows the Son of God or doesn't know the Son of God, whether he has accepted and begun relationship with God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit or whether he has not. But even beyond that, sometimes there's a, there's a scripture that says some men's judgment goes before them and some men's judgment lags behind. Meaning some men, what the world likes to call things like karma, which if you understand the principle of karma, it is very different from what the Bible says. The Bible does say, though, that you will reap what you sow and you'll sow what you reap, meaning the things that you put out there, you know, if you if you are if you are a critical person, criticism will come back to you. If you're an encouraging person, encouragement will come back to you. If you're a joyful person, joy will come back to you. If you're a sad person, someone who always chooses to find the bad and see the bad, then you will see more bad. And there's a way in which we bring a judgment on ourselves even before the final judgment, because our our Sins go before us, the things that we constantly indulge in. If you allow sexual sin in your life, then you are going to reap the benefit. You're going to reap the whirlwind. I almost said benefits. The whirlwind of what sexual sin brings along with it. If you have an angry disposition and you are always angry at people and, and cutting them down and using your strength and your power to bully people, that will come back in your own lifetime. You will see that people will deal with you according to that. If you you're a person who has um if you're if you're a person who's drawn by driven by fear and always making choices based on what you're the most afraid of then you will always find more and more things to be afraid of that's the nature of some men's judgment goes before them and some men's judgment lags behind and that god brings his reward with him meaning whatever accounts are open when the revelation of god occurs he will make all accounts equal he will he will zero the books out he will sum all the sums and total I, I don't i'm trying to use accounting terms my accountant's coming in today to help with some church stuff uh, actually my accountant's watching on here now hey good morning sally Good morning, Robin. Robin is actually our church accountant. And, um, but there's a way in which he balances all the books, and all his books are correct. And, and over and over again, the Bible uses that verbiage. We're at verse 10, and I'm going to have to get going because we're at verse we're at 728. So verse 11, he protects his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arm. He carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. That God is gentle with people. Sometimes I find people, even in church, as a pastor, that I, um, as the old preacher would say, just feel a spirit, a slap come on you. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're doing that. But that's not how God deals with us. He deals with us gently. He protects his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arm and carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. He's gentle with the young. In church, we have to be sure that when people are young in Christ, they're not, they're not as holy as you are yet. They haven't gotten to where you've gotten yet. So until they do, deal gently with them. Right? So verse 12, who has measured the water in the hollow of his hands or marked off the heavens with the span of his hands? Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure or weighed the mountains on a balance and the hills in a scale? Who is so there we're, we're, we're hearing the same language that you would hear in Job when he talks about, you know, when Job makes his accusation that God, I didn't do anything wrong and I'm getting punished. And and why God is this happening? And God is like, Job, do you have any idea who I am as God of the universe that Job has this moment where he stands before God and God says, look, Job, I did all of this. Everything you see I've created and I did it without anybody's help or anybody telling me what to do or anybody figuring it out. I am God, Job, and I can do all of this with or without your advice. 
advice. And man, how many times do we put our hand on the ox cart? How many times do we try to correct God? How many times have you seen in our society where someone looks at Scripture and says, well, that's not for today. That's just for back then. Or that's just, the, you know, where they try to take Scripture and water it down or take Scripture and make it mean something else because they can't handle that the Word of God has said what the Word of God says. So, <clears throat> verse 13, who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or given him counsel? Who did he consult? Who gave him understanding and taught him the paths of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? No one taught God justice. God is justice. God is just by his nature. And we know this because, because of who God is, because God exists, because if God were evil, if God were not good, if God were evil, we would think that evil was good because that would be the reference of all creation. God's goodness is the reference mark of all creation. God's justice is the reference mark of all creation. And most importantly, God's love is the reference mark of all creation. He is love, and love is what love is because God is it. It is in the character and nature of God. And because he exists, love is what love is. Verse 15, look, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are considered as a speck of dust on the scales. He lifts up his hands. He lifts up the islands like fine dust. Lebanon cedars are not enough for fuel or its animals enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are nothing before him. They consider him. They are considered by him as empty nothingness. When he says here, for instance, Lebanon cedars are not enough for fuel or its animals enough for a burnt offering. Understand that one of the big differences between um, the worship of God in Israel and the worship of Baals and Asherahs and Shemosh and, and uh, Marduk and all the gods around them is that they actually believed that their sacrifices were nourishment for their gods. So the reason they had sacrifices were because their gods were hungry, and so the sacrifice, the instance of the sacrifice, was the food of their gods, and so their gods were sustained by that. In fact, um, I believe the Babylonian mythology and several other mythologies of the time actually said that man was created to serve the gods because there was work the gods didn't want to do, and so they made men so men could do that work. Only in the Hebrew Bible do you have a God creating man and woman for fellowship who walks in the garden with his creation, who has a relationship of a father to a child, a relationship of a husband to a wife. Only in the Hebrew scriptures do you have the image of God as a loving God. Cheryl says God would be evil if he didn't give us a chance, to give him a choice to choose him, right? If it was absolutely set. That's the thing about love is that if you love somebody, if I love my wife and one day I'm like, you know what? I don't know if my wife loves me. If I were to lock her in a cage and say, you're going to stay in this cage until you love me, right? Is there anyone who wouldn't see that as evil, as, as just brutish, as wrong, right? That if I want my wife to love me, I don't do it through force or, you know, gun to your head, you better love me or lock you in a cage, you better love me, but I do it through, right? By, by speaking kindly to her, by reaching out to her, by meeting her needs, by, by, by talking to her, by having fellowship with her, that we establish love through relationship. And this is the way that God has set it between us and him, and in, in, in opposition to what Israel had around it, God was not there to be served by man, but he was a God who loved his children, right? Like back in verse 11, that he carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads them, right? Verse 18, with whom will you compare God? What likeness will you set up for him? Likeness with... What likeness will you set up for comparison with him? An idol, something that a smelter casts and a metal worker plates with gold and makes silver chains for? A poor person contributes wood for a pedestal that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not fall over. Um, one of the things they used to build into the idols back then, um, if you ever had G.I. Joes or Star Wars guys back in the day, if you remember on the bottom of their foot, there'd be a little hole. And that hole was so if you had a base, you could stand them on the base because they were really hard to stand up. I mean, you could get them to stand up if they were just right, but they would always topple over. So they'd have a little peg on there and you'd put the foot on the peg and that way the figurine, the figurine would stand up. Well, actually, the idols had a very similar system. They'd have a base, um, only in this case, the peg would be on the bottom of the idol and the peg of the idol would sit in the base so the idol wouldn't topple over because for them, 
It was a very bad sign if your idol fell over. That means your God fell over. That means he was either displeased with you or in the mythologies that they followed, that means that their God was being overwhelmed by another God or another force um, because in a lot of the mythologies there were gods that were equal forces with one another and one could overthrow one for a time and another could overthrow. And so if that statue toppled, that was a bad sign. And God is like, God is like, do you realize how silly it is that you're, you're literally setting up the support for your God? You're literally trying to sustain your God. And, and in contrast, the God of heaven doesn't need our sustenance. He doesn't need our approval. He doesn't need us to continue on. He is God all by himself, with or without us. He is still God. And so he's showing his majesty here to his people. And of course, this is right after he has wiped out this Assyrian army and delivered his people. And so he has shown himself mighty to the nation. Verse 21, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not considered the foundations of the earth? God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its, in, its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He, per, he reduces princes to nothing and makes judges of the earth like a wasteland. They are barely planted, barely sown. Their stem hardly takes root in the ground. When he blows, blows, and again we have the breath on them, and they wither, and the whirlwind carries them away like stubble. A lot of times when we see in our nation, right, in our nation we see evil powers rise. We see um, evil rise in our nation, and we see corruption enthroned, or we see people who are in power who are using that power to oppress people. Understand that when God wants to call time, when God sets his watch, when God says, okay, it's over, that his breath can just blow the whole thing away that it's nothing for him to do. It's not even an effort. It's the same amount of effort that you put into going, <sighs> and with that, God could completely remove a system of power, a nation, a structure, anything that stands in the way of his will. So verse 25, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Asked the Holy One. Look up and see who created these. He brings out the stars by number. He calls all of them by name because of his great power and strength. Not one of them is missing. This is in particular, in particular to the gods of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, who worship the stars and who look for messages in the stars. And God is saying, I put all of the stars there. I know them all by name. So before there was ever a national star registry that you could, for a couple of dollars, uh, name a star in some far-off universe after somebody that they'll never see without a very powerful telescope, here was God already giving that star a name, already calling out to it by name name. Verse 27, Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert my way is hidden from the Lord and my claim is ignored by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He is a God in the present. He is a God of the big. He is a God of the small. He is a God of the world. He is a God of the nations. He is a God of our sit, our states. He is a God of our city. He is a God of your family. He is your God. That he can deal with all of humanity in a very individual level or on a very corporate level as he chooses. He sees pictures that we do not see. He sees the earth move in ways that we cannot perceive. He knows our comings and our goings as a nation, as a world. And even this morning when I woke up and God's like, don't hit that snooze button, David. And I'm like, oh, but Lord, it hurts so early, right? And, and, and God is infinitely interested even in the little things in our life that he wants to have fellowship with us and walk with us and be with us. He is a God of the present and he is a God of presence. Verse 29, he gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless and again, think of this in the context of who Isaiah is talking to here. The ones coming out of this great devastation that has covered their land in the deliverance of the Lord, even after everything is gone in the aftermath of the wrath and the rage and all of the things that the Assyrians brought with them, that this chapter is a turning point from wrath to love. That when you look at the whole book of Isaiah, this is a turning point between the wrath that was coming on them as the Assyrians were gathering in the north 
and the love and restoration of a God who comes back in and heals the wounds that were made, who comes back in after the wrath is over. I always put it in, when I was growing up, um, I, would get, we, I was raised when you got a spanking, right? I mean, you did something wrong, you'd get your, you'd get your butt whooped, right? And I don't know how many parents do that now. Um, but it, when I was raised, that was a thing, right? And I remember the way my dad never just left it at that. So if I did something wrong, my dad would, my dad would come in. He'd sit down with me and say, son, I love you, but you know what you did was wrong. I told you if you do it, you were going to get a spanking. And then he would spank me. And he'd, I mean, he pulled out a belt and spanked me. It hurt, right? And he'd leave the room. But then he'd come back in in a few minutes, and I'd be crying. I mean, he'd be ugly crying. I mean, just stupid crying, just <laughs> like, like you can't even speak crying, right? My dad would sit down beside me, and he'd say, son, you know I love you. And you know, I had to spank you because of what you did, but you're still my son and I love you. I never forget that, right? I never forget those conversations. I, I can remember the room, right? What the room would look like when my dad would come back in and have those moments of love with me where he'd sit back down and say, son, you had to go through the punishment. You had to go through the discipline. You had to go through what you went through because of what you've done. But listen, it's forgiven and I love you and you've suffered for it and it's over. And so what does he finish the chapter with? He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Youths may become faint and weary, and young men, men stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. That, that what, what those who trust in the Lord, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. It's an active trust. It's not a passive waiting, but it's an active on the edge of your seat. It's like you're waiting for your favorite show to come on and you're flipping through the channels trying to find it. You know that God is going to speak, so you're out there waiting for him to speak to you. You know that he's going to deliver you, so you are anticipating the deliverance of God. And in that anticipating the deliverance of God, he strengthens us for the journey ahead. That there is going to be a time we are are either going to see him with our eyes when he parts the cloud and blows the trumpet or we're going to see him when we stand before him having left this mortal body behind but one thing is for sure we will see him as he is we will be there and so the whole chapter here all of this thing where it's talking about the evangelism the voice the speaking the breathing it's a kind of trumpet that's blowing because Christ is coming and before he comes there's always the herald there's the one that makes straight the path in the wilderness and God is calling us today as a church to make straight the path for his return, that he is going to do something on this earth, but he is calling men and women to blow the trumpet in Zion and to sound the alarm that the Lord is coming. He's coming to comfort those that are afflicted, and he's coming to afflict those that are comforted. He's coming to bring justice, and he's bringing judgment, but he's bringing mercy, and he's bringing grace, and it is going to be a great and marvelous day, the day of the Lord. So with that, I went you know, 12 minutes over the time, but we've come to expect that. Thank you guys for joining me this morning. I pray that you're blessed. Pray that you have a great morning. Pray that God brings his presence into your life, that you just have a moment where you're absolutely surprised by the awesome, wonderful presence of God. Till then, be real, be one. Wait, be real, be loved, be 